Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can gain access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is David Hogg. David Hogg is a gun violence activist and a history major at Harvard University. He rose to national prominence after surviving the mass shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018. And this episode is all about gun violence. Despite surviving a mass shooting, David feels, and I agree, that mass shootings get more attention than they should that we should pay at least as much, if not more, attention to the far greater number of people getting murdered in violent neighborhoods every day. David and I clash somewhat over the right approach to gun control. We spend a good deal of time arguing about whether it makes sense to have armed security guards in schools. We talk about the Second Amendment and the role historical context should play in our assessment of modern day policies, and much more. So without further ado... David Hogg. All right, David Hogg, thank you so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having me on. So uh, I I think a lot of my podcast listeners will be familiar with who you are. And I'll I'll give you an introduction in in the intro I do after this. But um, let's just, you know, start with a little bit of your background. Obviously, I don't want to rehash the parts that everyone knows. But prior to the Parkland shooting, I'm curious what, if at all, your views on gun control were just as a kid growing up in in a context where it hadn't yet become personal for you? Yeah, so I think growing up, uh, the main source of education on gun control on uh, most policy areas that, that I got uh, was from debating them in my speech and debate class throughout uh, all of high school um, in the type of debate that it did. It was called public forum uh, debate. And the main education that I had gotten around gun violence, gun control, SROs, school security, et cetera, came from different um different arguments that we had every month. So pre one time we had to argue about whether or not we should have SROs, school resource officers, um, which are police officers in schools, uh, in schools or not. Um, another time, uh, it was about the, whether or not we should, the United States should implement federal, uh, universal background checks at a federal level. And as part of that, we have to argue both sides, both pro and con. Um, and from that, I mainly gained my experience in education, I guess you could say, uh, prior to everything happening and in gun control. And I grew up shooting guns with my dad, who was an FBI agent, um, and many conservative, you know, and even liberal family members that had guns themselves. Um, we have guns in our house. So I've, I've always grown up around them. Um, and I just, my view personally was always that, you know, I don't see why it's such a big deal to need a background check for a weapon. I didn't really understand why somebody needed a weapon like an AR-15 after seeing what happened, you know, at, at Sandy Hook when I was at that time in middle school. Um, I don't understand why that's needed for, you know, after seeing what happened in Pulse and so many other hor- horrific instances um, across the country. So uh, I guess my main views came from speech and debate and just that, you know, we see across the board pretty much universally states with stronger gun laws tend to have lower rates of gun violence. Um, and countries with stronger gun laws tend to have significantly lower rates of gun violence. Um, so, yeah. So is your, uh, so, uh, on your Wikipedia page, I, I found that your, your goal is to become a politician. Is that, is that still true? Obviously things could be changing a lot. Um, well, I don't, I don't what, necessarily know old? who, I don't know who necessarily put that in there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but in, I mean, in the past, I had considered running for office, I think in the, in the days mm-hmm. after everything mm-hmm. happening um, and trying to figure out what the quickest way to make something change was. I don't mm-hmm. know if it's necessarily uh, needed for me to run for office. I hope that that's not the conclusion or I hope that's not a necessity that I feel that I have a choice that I have to make in order to make this change 
in the most impactful way or the best way that I can contribute in a small way to the, to a movement that is so much bigger than myself and any in sole individual. Um, and I think especially after working around so many, you know, elected officials and stuff and seeing, uh, the effects that it has on people's families, mm-hmm. you know, and the family dynamic, mm-hmm. the cost of that, um, the public dynamic and everything like that. Um, I think it may be more impactful for me just to be on the outside. But if I, if I really feel like that, I, I'm trying to see that as my last resort, if you will, um, yeah. because I've seen how, you know, DC can take good people and corrupt them for lack of a better term, oftentimes because of, you know, the enshrined power structures and the way that things are often purposely set up uh, to main, maintain power structures of certain individuals and corrupt systems. Um, as much as I would like to see that change, I don't want to have to negotiate necessarily within that system myself. So I don't know if I will or not, but I certainly just want to help uh, contribute to ending this issue as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. People often think I, I want to become a politician too. And it's, you know, I've never indicated that actually. And I, everything you just said about the costs and downsides of being a politician seems pretty obvious to me, but, um, you, you have to have a certain, certain kind of character to really flourish and maintain who you are in that, in that environment. So I'm totally here. Are you at yeah. Harvard now still? Is that true at least? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it is. And, and do, I, have I you decided your major yet. Yeah. So I'm studying history and probably going to do a secondary in government. Um, and that I'm about to be a junior. I just spent the entire year online. Um, so it's, it's been, nice. I guess it's been nice being around my family, uh, considering how crazy the two years, you know, the year and a half prior to COVID, uh, were for me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go back to school next semester. So, yeah. Yeah. The zoom classes, I remember I, I caught the end of the zoom classes at, at Columbia at the very end of my time there. And mm-hmm. it was really disheartening how much of a difference it made in the degree to which people gave a shit. Um, right. I wonder if that's been for true sure. for you as well. Um, I mean, I can't talk much about my classmates because everybody's been impacted in different ways by the pandemic, um, mentally, academically, and so on. Um, I think for me, it's, it's certainly been a struggle to stay motivated, especially when a lot of my work is archive based and I'm, you know, supposed to be going, if it, if it wasn't a pandemic, I would be going through archives, looking for primary sources and other documents right now. And I, I still am, it's just not in the physical way. So it's been a challenge to get in contact with different archivists, you know, and go through digital collections and trying to figure out how to get stuff mailed to me from different archives around the country to work on different uh, historical projects. So yeah, it's, is, is there it's a, been a challenge. Is there a subfield within history that you're particularly interested in? Um, I don't, I would say probably just American history generally, um, but really probably more like 20th century and maybe some, uh, some 19th century American history. Uh, cause I think, I think the 19th century at times can get a little downplayed in it and the impact that it's had even on today's politics and how we got here. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I spent the last semester working a lot on, uh, the history of town gown relations, uh, between universities and their cities, um, in, especially in DC uh, and some of the schools here in the mid 20th century and if the effects on the, on, uh, the political economy between, you know, the, the university and the towns uh, that they're in, uh, as schools started to become, uh, co-ed, uh, in, in the mid 20th century. So that was one of my main focuses. So. Oh, cool. So, um, so, all right. So, so let's just sharp pivot to the issue of gun violence and mass shootings, the perennial issue that every sane American wants to see uh, solved. You know, this is a, I think this is a, you know, I, I put out on Twitter that I was talking to you and got some replies from, you know, a lot of people who really hate you. And it, it just reminded me of the fact that the gun control debate in America truly brings out the worst in people. And um, that's just something I've observed. And I think there's, there's no reason for it. I think it should be possible to have you know, respectful arguments and disagreements um, about, you know, about the proper ethics and proper policies on this front. And um, I'm going to try to model that, model that today. And I, I hope 
we can sort of get to a better place with this topic in this country because the tenor of the conversation is just so ugly. And you've been, you, a lot of that ugliness has been directed at you in the past few years. And I, so, so that's just to say, you know, don't, don't let the, uh, the trolls get to you because it's, it's truly ugly out there on this topic. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I find it, it's very hard to stay positive and not feed into that negativity. Um, which, you know, obviously I at times have certainly fed into, but it's, it is a very toxic debate. Um, and it's an extremely hard conversation to have, unfortunately, because it is so important for us to have it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so let's, let's just start with the definition of a mass shooting. I mean, this is a category that is a little bit, um, a little bit tricky because if I'm just talking to someone about mass shootings, what we usually mean is the terrifying random mass shooting of someone who goes into, whether it's a school or, you know, a park and for no reason other than their mental unhealth or, you know, wanting to see the world burn to use the, cliche from Batman, just indiscriminately murder people that they have no social connection to no particular vendetta against like that. That's the kind that that's really what people in casual conversation mean by mass shooting. But the technical definition of a mass shooting is any shooting that involves four victims or more, even if none of them die. Right. So those are two, those are two very different things. And so right off the bat, the conversation can get confusing because the, the policies and attitudes that might make sense for the terrifying random mass shootings that dominate the news might not make sense for the everyday sort of, uh, um, occurrence in in many high crime neighborhoods of whether they're gang shootings or personal vendettas where people are just or drive-bys spraying bullets and hit four people right these are kind of different phenomena and and so is that is this a distinction that you think about a lot and and when when you talk and think about mass shootings which one are you concerned about you know, I, I really try to stay away from focusing on, you know, trying to categorize these things as one mass shooting or not. Although, of course, they, it matters what type of, you know, gun violence it is in terms of the policy prescriptions that um, should be provided or enacted to, to prevent these horrible instances. Uh, I think what I think about a lot more specifically is the fact that the conversation even mainly starts and stops with mass shootings and the fact that there are several hundred mass shootings basically in the United States every day um, without have the same effect, you know, where there are just, you know, several hundred people that die from gun violence. And it may not be that they're all dying at the same time with, you know, four people at once dying, but nonetheless, the effect on these, on people's, on the community, the effect on people's families is just the same, if not more, because they don't get attention. Right. So I really don't even like to start the conversation with mass shootings, although obviously that's why I got into this work in the first place. Because the reality is that they make up less than 1% of all gun deaths if we're talking just about, you know, four people or more. Um, and we tend, when we get so focused and cramped down on, or, or you know, on the numbers, we're not as, we're, we have a tendency, I've found, to lose the humanity of these individuals that are stolen, you know, not just lost, but frankly stolen from their families by something that, in my opinion, I view as largely a preventable instance of violence that is a public health issue. Um, that you know, is solvable. So I think when people talk about mass shootings, I often think, uh, you know, additionally about how these instances of gun violence truly are, in my view, products of different forms of injustice. And of course, when it comes to mass shootings, they're oftentimes a product of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, uh, white supremacists that, you know, pick up a gun and have easy access to it, like the shooter at my high school um, that have been known to have anti-Semitic, you know, opinions, um, and behaviors, and then act, you know, at times, you know, go and act in extremely violent ways, 
uh, towards their classmates. So what I, I guess what I'm getting at is that I think we need to start the conversation with the fact that these are human beings that are dying. And although numbers in terms of policy uh, making do matter, ultimately what matters are the human beings that are behind those numbers that really needs to be talked about on a daily basis. Because what doesn't make it on the news is the fact that there have been, you know, I'm in DC this summer, how many shootings there have been here, which is horrible. You know, in the past week, there was one, or not the past week, but in the past couple of weeks, there was one, a couple just, you know, right down the block from where my friends were eating dinner. Um, there was one where, uh, you know, there were a bunch of people that I knew that were at a, a baseball game and there was a shooting right by there. I think like just a couple of days ago, or you know, maybe even like two days ago. And those things don't necessarily, they may make it on the news, but it's not nearly talked about in the same way, even though people are still dying in those instances. So again, it comes back to the societal role that it plays and the fact that these are human beings that are dying and how frankly fucked up it is that we start at only necessarily talking about or caring about, oh, how many people died there? If it's if it's less than four, we can't really even talk about it because it doesn't even make it on the news. And even those shootings that where four or more people do die are starting to not even become newsworthy because we're so complacent and used to these instances of gun violence, unfortunately, because our country is so apathetic towards an issue that is so, in my opinion, uh, solvable. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree that the the conversation should be about gun violence broadly, not just the, the, you know, horror movie mass shootings, uh, that, that capture people's attention. It should just as much, if not more, be about the, the, just the daily loss of life that is happening in America's high crime neighborhoods and has been for decades. And here's where the, the gun control, um, conversation has often seemed out of step with, with a, a rational approach to, to reducing these shootings. So, you know, the, the focus has often on the left been on assault weapons and assault rifles, this, this sort of nebulous category that isn't responsible for really almost any of the daily loss of life that's happening in high violence neighborhoods and and also you know the notion of gun ownership in general there's there's always this this paradox at the heart of the gun violence problem in America which is that places you know in cities which have a much lower rate of legal gun ownership often have the highest rates of gun violence and that's obviously the correlation is not causation but it certainly challenges the idea that well what we need to do is a, you know, or, or whether or not we need to do these things, it challenges the idea that getting rid of, you know, banning certain kinds of, of real, you know, semi-automatic weapons and reducing the rate of legal gun ownership is going to save lives in the places where, uh, in the places where people are losing lives every day, because so many of these guns are illegal to, to begin with. And, uh, you know, operating on the black market, that's, it's very difficult to, to sort of, um, regulate obviously. And, and so I'm curious to hear what, you know, what is the conversation we should be having? What are the policies you feel would make it so that we don't have to read every summer that, you know, two-year-olds and three-year-olds are getting shot in drive-by shootings in you know, in, in, on the South side of Chicago and East St. Louis and, and all of the neighborhoods we've come to take for granted as, as hotbeds of violence. Yeah. So I think on the topic of the assault weapons aspect, you know, I'm by no means specifically a firearms expert in terms of that. And, you know, it's, it's a common scapegoat that's used to talk about these things when, in, you know, to, to shut down the conversation about the assault weapons and stuff. What I will say is that I, I think perhaps as we're having that conversation and people that are quite frankly, more qualified than I am to be talking specifically on the legal dynamics of what is and is not an assault weapon. A good step that we could make is actually reducing uh, high capacity magazine sizes and the accessibility to them or even their legality, because the real, you know, one of the biggest things is that the, the shoot, the, the people in, in these instances of mass shootings that are using weapons like an AR 15 
have that lethality oftentimes, not just because of obviously the power of the weapon in the first place, but I, I would say just as much uh, the high capacity magazines that they're using that have more than 10 rounds in them. Um, and if we have smaller magazines, it can, A, cut, you know, it takes more time for them to actually reload and allows more people to, you know, tackle them or, you know, uh, someone to step in and help stop it from happening in the first place. Uh, and B, it allows that conversation that I think should be had about what is and is not an assault weapon um, to continue on. But in the meantime, we can take that very immediate step to talk about, you know, in those instances, how can we stop it from being such a high casualty rate? Um, and I, I think the best first step for that is a high capacity magazine ban, limiting it to something like 10 rounds, which I think, you know, most people, even if you're just talking about the common argument, like self-defense in your home, uh, I don't think you need 30 rounds for that, in my opinion. I think that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but on the topic of how a lot of these guns are legal, you know, you're right, they are oftentimes. But I think we need to realize, too, that there are many places where there are, you know, uh, separate public health issues, such as smoking, where there have been black markets that have been set up in the past to avoid taxes or a number of other things. Um, however, we still work towards regulating it because although there are people that get out there and do things that are still legal, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything on the legal side either. Um, and I think that also speaks to the reason why we need pol basically prescriptions of policies for uh, with nuance incorporated into them and the way that we talk about gun violence in America by not just talking about how does somebody get a gun legally or illegally in the first place, but also how do we prevent someone from wanting to get a gun in the first place? And that's part of the, the issue that I have with the debate oftentimes is that it just stops with only talking about gun control. But in reality, I think what conversation, the conversation that really needs to be had is a conversation uh, about gun violence prevention and not just how do we control guns, but how do we stop people from wanting to shoot each other in the first place? And oftentimes in neighborhoods where there are high rates of gun violence, um, obviously they're, they're, they tend to be disproportionately affected by systemic racism, a history of redlining, uh, you know, a, a, a multitude of issues. And honestly, in my, in my view, uh, a centuries of compounding injustices that often results in this violence. And one of the best solutions for those communities where there are illegal guns that come in would A, be a federal, some system of federal regulation to help reduce interstate trafficking so that somebody can't go and buy 30 guns in Indiana, bring them to Chicago as the south side like you brought up and then sell them. Instead, they would be limited to something like one gun per month so they couldn't, you know, necessarily as easily go over there and sell that many guns in the first place. On top of that, we need to think about how do we prevent young people, especially who are often the perpetrators of gun violence that are even teenagers at times, from wanting to pick up a gun. And we know from research um, that the C that CDC and other agencies and uh, think tanks and people have done that one of the common predictors of who shoots somebody else is if, whether or not they or a loved one have been shot before, and it's because it's retaliation. And some of the best programs at reducing gun violence in neighborhoods like that, where there is where there are illegal guns, is uh, are called violence intervention programs that offer community counseling and therapists and a number of other community members at the hospital to help stop retaliation from happening. And in, in the areas where they've done that, mind you, that doesn't necessarily have to do anything with regulating guns more whatsoever. That is simply trying to change behaviors from people from shooting each other in the first place. And in the areas where they've implemented those things, they've had pretty significant impacts at reducing gun violence. You know, we there's a conversation as well that needs to be had about uh, the incredibly high suicide rate uh, across America that are two thirds of gun deaths that are just often completely left out of the conversation. That needs a whole separate policy prescription. So there are so many different nuances in this conversation that need to be had that I, I truly hate it when it just gets shut down around, do we need to control guns or not? Because in my opinion, we do need to have more gun control, but it also goes way beyond that because we need to have behavioral intervention systems in place to help stop people from wanting to shoot each other or shoot themselves in the first place, right? And it's hard to have that nuance when it's such a loaded conversation. Because I think most people could agree to some form of public health measure that helps invest in communities and not just focusing on incarcerating more people, but actually a preventative measure at stopping gun violence or stopping people from wanting to shoot each other before they shoot each other. That we know has had an impact and doesn't even have to do with regulating guns. And that's one thing that, um, that I've advocated for my organization, 
that I work within and I'm on the board of March for Our Lives is advocated for the Biden administration is to get more funding allocated so that we can set up better, you know, better and more uh, violence intervention programs across the country. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, that's a great answer. I, I really couldn't agree more. I, I know there are, there are, you know, this is one of those things where people, because we, as Americans, we see things happening in other parts of the country. We want there to be a solution that we can vote for to make us feel that, that we're in control, but often the solutions have to be local and embedded in a particular community. So, you know, in, in Chicago, there's a, the organization called Mothers Against Senseless Killings. Uh, there's another one called Operation Lipstick. There are all of these sort of local organizations that similar to what you mentioned of actually, for instance, going to someone who, who just got shot and is in the hospital and has been raised in a culture where, where you can't expect, like, if you're not going to retaliate or your friends aren't going to retaliate, then basically you, you lose face in the community and you've been raised in a, in a, in a, in a culture where, you know, uh, back and forth tit for tat violence is normalized and the definition of masculinity uh, it's like, how do you actually stop that cycle from happening? That That's a very difficult thing to do f- from a bureaucrat's office in, in D.C., even from a state bureaucrat's office. And, 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 and again, it's not a simple matter of gun control. You know, I had Anthony Barksdale on this podcast a couple months ago, who is the former deputy commissioner of the Baltimore Police Department. And he told me, you know, he, he was, you know, back in the day, he was very much a, a tough on crime, uh, a commissioner. Uh, but he found that he often could not bring himself to arrest someone in Baltimore who had an illegal handgun because he, know, he knew that many of the people who had them were not at all troublemakers, but knew that they, they lived in in an extremely high violence community where they could not depend on the police to come in time to protect them and their family in the event of a home invasion. And how can you truly blame such a person, much less arrest them when they're doing something that that's totally rational. And that's part of what makes it tricky to, to simply say, Oh, well, we just have to, you know, toughen the, these gun gun laws. And, you know, there, there's, it occurs to me also the Breonna Taylor, the, the shooting of Breonna Taylor last year, which most people thought of in terms of the conversation about Black Lives Matter. If you, if, if you come at it from a totally different angle from, from, from gun control, Kenneth Walker, who was Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, from his perspective, someone was just invading his apartment and he was a legal gun owner. So he shot at the person. Now it turns out that person was a cop, but he had no way of being sure that that person was a cop. He couldn't, he couldn't hear them shout police, much less believe that they are in fact police. If you live in a, if you live in a, in in a, in a situation where home invasions happen, where violence is regular. Um, and so, so there has to be some, some kind of middle ground between people who want to make it impossible to, to own a gun. Um, and people who want, don't even want any kind of common sense gun control, including universal background checks and, and, you know, magazine limits and, um, you know, something like a bump stock ban. There's got to be a middle ground here that, that we can find. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that, I, I hope that the, the net result of the enthusiasm for, for, you know, coming out of the March for our lives and, and, and everything is sort of directed at this middle ground. Um, and, and okay, it does, does that provoke any thoughts in you? Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of it, I personally think the best approach in my view is that we know in general countries that have less guns in society in general, you know, whether it be the police or uh, civilians themselves, tend to have less gun violence, unsurprisingly. In some countries, many police officers don't even carry guns in the first place, right? And I see, obviously, the, the conversation around what happened uh, to an, any number of individuals, but especially in the case of Breonna Taylor and other people, you know, a conversation needing to be had about uh, state 
forms of gun violence on its own citizens, obviously. Um, and in some ways, I feel like it's almost like an arms race where these SWAT teams end up militarizing and using civilian arms like the AR-15 or, you know, take your pick. It doesn't have to be that, you know, it any number of these weapons to justify why they need to be more militarized, why they need bigger guns and vice versa. And it, it, it kind of is this, is this uh, back and forth between police departments, local law enforcement uh, and um, civilians. When in reality, I think we need to focus on how can we start to demilitarize our ridiculously militarized, at least, you know, society as a whole, where it's not just, you know, the civilians in the first place that don't necessarily have, act. of course, I don't want anybody being endangered, you know, in the first place. Wait, so so when uh, you say de- demilitarize, what do you mean? I mean, over time, how can we reduce the number of guns in society? At least that's my view. And we have to figure out a good way to go about it. And I'm not necessarily sure of what that is. I'm just saying in societies, in countries where there are less guns, there are less shootings. Both right. So, so but yeah. can, can we actually draw the, the lesson that it might seem like we can draw from that? I mean, you know, th- that can be true, but, you know, A, there's the practicality problem of there are more guns than people in America. And so much of it is, is operating on the black market that it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, if let's just get weed off the streets, it's like, okay, it's one thing to say that, but it's like, it's an incredibly difficult practical problem, if not impossible to actually achieve. No. Yeah. Well, I, I think what it, what it comes, and I I don't want you mischaracterizing what I'm trying to say here. I'm not saying that we completely demilitarize everything and that nobody ever has access to a hunting rifle or, or whatever it may be in the first place. The approach that I think of much more is akin to kind of what we, what many people think of what should have been done in the first place necessarily with, you know, uh, a lot of common illicit drugs, which isn't a total ban on everything, obviously, because you just end up creating a black market because that demand is still there, but creating some kind of well-regulated system, as is talked about in the constitution with the well-regulated militia, you know, so that we are at the the kind of connection between having it regulated enough that we're able to prevent as many deaths as possible, but also not create a necessarily sustainable black market in the first place. And obviously there's a lot of economics and different policy things that go into that in the first place. But that's kind of what I see as the eventuality that hopefully we end up coming to in the United States. And do I know where that is right now? No, I couldn't tell you because I'm not, I can't predict the future. I don't have a PhD in public health or policy making in the first place or even a, a law degree of some sort, but that's kind of what I see it coming towards is how can we make sure that we are creating a system that doesn't incentivize nearly as big of a black market as we have right now. And we're able to reduce the size of that, but have a system as well, where individuals are, you know, not dying left and right in senseless mass killings because people believe that universal background checks are ridiculous or that they should have a hundred round magazine as an example. Mm-hmm. So I think there's one disanalogy between drugs and guns, which is, so for instance, when you ban marijuana, you create the conditions, as you said, you create the conditions for a black market. Uh, The difference with guns is that there will always be conditions for a black market, no matter what we do, because even if we had the perfect gun policy, Right. We had universal background checks, ban on unnecessary modifications, um, you know, limiting the magazines to the right, the right size. That in, even in that condition, there would still be just pretty much just as big a demand for, for a black market in guns because clearly we wouldn't give guns to criminals, people with a criminal history or, or a violent criminal history. And often those are the people who want guns the most. And so there's, uh, there's, there's actually, even in principle, there's basically no way of getting rid of the black market for guns, uh, of the black market demand for guns, right? Well, I think it's, it comes down to how, you know, obviously there's a lot of nu- nuances that have to be added to the conversation because every community is different. All of these things are different. There's no society, at least that I can view in the next hundred years, unfortunately, where uh, that necessarily doesn't exist because of, you know, the stuff that you said. Um, but I do think that 
clearly what we have right now is not working, right? Clearly 40,000 people dying a year in a uh, high income country like the United States, even putting aside suicides, you know, if, if we're talking about the the one third that are intentional shootings and completely negating any of the validity around, you know, gun suicides happening in the first place, which I think need to be part of the conversation. That many people still dying is still doesn't need to be nearly as high as it is in the first place. And of course, there are much larger things at, at, at play in society that can impact that. Um, but I think there, that's part of the reason why there needs to be more nuance to this conversation. And it's not just about how do we regulate the guns? It's not just about you know that. It's also about, as I said, it's about how to stop people from wanting to shoot each other. And it just, it just doesn't go straight into right before someone's going to go and injure someone. It starts you know, from the crib. How are we going to stop someone from ha- being, you know, clearly there's a reason why some of the, like the poorest communities that have been affected the most by redlining, by other instances of systemic racism, of economic injustice, of these different, you know, things compounding in our society. Um, how can we, you know, have some of those more nuanced policy conversations that may not even be related to guns in the first place? And those are hard conversations to have because there's so many different factors that play into the creation of this issue. Right. It's a, it goes far beyond just how do we stop somebody from getting a gun in the first place and how do we stop them from shooting each other, uh, you know, immediately beforehand. It goes way beyond that into the years before. And how do we stop people from wanting to get a gun off the black market in the first place or feeling the need for that? And it may not be possible to ever get to zero, unfortunately, but I think we'd be damned if we didn't try. So, you know, so so I, I you said and I agree that it's almost impossible to foresee a scenario in the, in America where we reduce the number of guns per capita legal and illegal, um, you know, where we cut it in half, even I would say over the next hundred years, or we, if we get to, you know, European or Australian levels, it, it's very difficult to see how that happens practically, even though I, w- I would be very happy, much happier to live in an America that looked like that. Um, I'm, I'm very unlikely to ever own a gun myself, not impossible, but it's just, it's it's very unlikely. Um, you know, given that that's true and given that people fear mass shootings in particular, is it, why, why is it wrong to make people feel safer by say having a, a, an armed security guard or, or a police men in, in schools. What do you make of that idea? Do you think that's a good idea or not? No, I, I, I think the reality is behind it that it's security theater. There was a police officer at my school and all the years since we've, we have hired thousands of school resource officers, there's not a single instance where they've actually stopped a school shooting from happening, you know, where they actually intervened. So is, I, is it, I see why that. Why is that? Because of cowardice? Or probably, I mean, I can't tell you the exact reasons. I don't know the motivations of these individuals. I think the person at my school may, you know, is probably cowardice, fear, you name it. Um, but I think a lot of that's security theater. And I think if we look at the, the instances of actual school violence between these school resource officers and students, not even, not even talking about how often they have, you know, they could possibly kidnap students, they could sexually assault them, molest them, or et cetera you know, because not all these people are necessarily good people in the first place. Um, Putting all of that aside, because that stuff has happened and it does happen. It also, it also endangers students themselves. You know, should the best solution really be when I'm talking to a student about their, you know, how they're talking to me about their mental health issues as I've done, I've had many conversations about and students come up to me and say, yeah, I went to my campus you know, my can't, my counselor at my school. And I said, I have depression, you know, I need help with that. I need to see like a school psychiatrist or, or, or what have you. And they get put on a list of possible mass shooters. That's not productive or helpful to the conversation at all at actually ending this in the first place. And I think those resources would be significantly better spent elsewhere where they could actually have an impact like those violence intervention programs that are not necessarily policing based but are aimed at getting students, getting young people in general on a better track that have had an impact. I think in regards to the self-defense aspect, personally, one of the reasons why I would never own a gun in the first place is because if we look at the actual, if we go not with our, the concept of how Americans like to view 
uh, guns and that they're, everyone thinks they may be a vigilante or some kind of version of Superman or something, and that they can just immediately have perfect aim with a firearm that they often have very little training with at all. And even if they do, they're still, you know, not required to practice it that much at all. Um, oftentimes the person that you endanger most by having a gun in your house, if you actually look at the statistics on it is yourself or somebody else in your household. Households that have guns have a five times higher chance of somebody in the house, even if they're not the gun owner, killing themselves if they have a gun in the household, because the success rate uh, of gun suicide is unfortunately so high. Um, on top of that, I cannot tell you the plethora of instances that I've heard of individuals that A, have a gun turned on them, or B, have their home invaded because people know that there are guns in there so they can go and sell them on the black market, which is enabled by the gun lobby that makes it harder to make sure that we're able to actually track down these guns in the first place, you know, through the different systems that have been created that are purposely corrupted to, to make it hard, um, which enables that black market to even be more existent and prevalent. Not to say it wouldn't be there if we had the perfect system in place. It likely still would be. It just wouldn't be at the same level. So all of those things combined, I think, you know, people are going to own guns and so be it if that's what they choose to do. I personally just think that it's a little ridiculous that somebody should be able to buy a weapon like, you know, a handgun or what have you without something as simple as a universal, you know, a universal background check if it's done through a private sale um, or the gun show loophole or any number of these other instances. So that's my view on it. People obviously have their own views of their own safety and everything, but that's that's the reality because the emotions in this situation, as is often the case in policymaking, are very different from the the statistical realities that people go through in the, in such an emotional area like gun violence in the United States. Yeah. Again, like, like I said, I have all those same reservations about myself owning a gun. I think if I did do it, I would be on the most responsible end of the gun ownership spectrum because of my personality. But, and I think, I do think it's possible to judge yourself at the competent end of the spectrum at the same time you know, just having a gun in your home is something that far more people take way too lightly, right? Like the, the, probably the typical gun owner takes it far more lightly than, than they should. And that, that itself is a major problem. But I want to, I want to return to this point about having a security officer in the school. It's like, you know, I, I really could not bring myself to seriously worry about a police officer or a security guard kidnapping or molesting a student. And it's not to say that those things never happen. It's to say that we shouldn't use the outliers as the rule of thumb for the policy, right? It's like you, you could do the same on the other side of the argument and, and say, well, there are a couple hundred examples every year of, of good gun owners, um, you know, saving the day that, that does sometimes happen. It's rare, but it happens a couple hundred times a year where someone has a gun in public and is able to stop the bad guy and, and save a life. But those things are so rare that they shouldn't be the main consideration. Well, here's the other thing. So, so I would argue the same thing about having a security officer in the schools. Like and it, how, how often are they going to get kidnapped versus well, here, here's the thing. I think you're feel safe. I believe that you're mischaracterizing the total point, the main point of what I'm saying there, which is that there are those instances. And the main reason I brought those up is because I've been talking with people recently about research that has been going on around that. Obviously, that's not the majority of these instances in the way that they may be endangering students. But the reality is, if we want to go with the total holistic view as you're talking about and not just talk about these statistical outliers, there are no statistical outliers when it comes to actually stopping school shootings in the first place, despite tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of school resource officers being you know, brought into schools. And the reality is many schools around the world do not have police officers and they don't have school shootings. And it's not because they have school resource officers in their schools. It's because they have a society that values human life over, quite frankly, ridiculously easy access to weapons in the first place. So that's what I mean when I'm, that's the main point that I'm getting yeah. at is the, these resources are being misspent because we have a society that loves to use essentially the police as a hammer for every policy issue, even if that's not the best thing to do. And I personally believe that those resources would be spent better in other places. Yeah, I, I get that. I think he, here's, here's what I worry about. I, when you say we have a society that, you know, obviously America has a crazy gun culture society. 
we have a level of violence in our society that puts us completely out of step with all of the nations we typically compare ourselves to in the world. And that has something to do with the culture, um, no doubt. So here, here's what I worry about. I don't know how to remake society from, from whole cloth into a society with a different set of norms. That seems, it's possible. It seems very difficult and it seems like a far away goal. What might put me more at ease is to create a training program for, for people, uh, a high prestige job almost akin to the military where your only job is if there's a mass shooting at the school, you are expected to sacrifice your life to defend it, right? Like that seems also hard, but not as hard as remaking all of society. So given that it it seems like a really tough issue to actually solve, we're going to have guns in this country forever. Is that not the more realistic or practical path to walk down, even if it's, we haven't come close to perfecting it yet? No, because I think if we measure the total number of lives that are going to be basically destroyed by further incarcerating children because of, you know, school resource officers being often used as a hammer on kids at times. And granted, you know, there are, there are exceptions to this. There are students that are violent, like the shooter at my high school that need to have, you know, not be in school in the first place. That is an exception that I'm willing to make that obviously needs to be addressed. Uh, and that's specifically what I'm ta- sorry, what I'm talking about in, in that regard is that the number of total students, especially students of color that have worked extensively with me and you know in the in the gun violence prevention space specifically that advocate on this issue. And after talking to them and working in schools, you know, where you know there are school resource officers, the way that I personally see it is that the total number of lives that end up being frankly destroyed by being incarcerated for something or being put down a path for something that frankly could have been handled in a number of different ways. And also the number of students that end up getting severely assaulted or even killed by these school resource officers far outnumbers how, you know, any, the reality, which is that they haven't stopped a single school shooting. So why have them in the first place? We have had 20 years since Columbine with school resource officers being extremely prevalent throughout American society, not once have they stopped a school shooting. I don't see that fear of that that possibility of them ever stopping one, even though they haven't in 20 years. And we spent hundreds of millions of dollars on these school resource officers as being worth more than preventing students from being incarcerated, students uh, and administrators specifically using them as a hammer on students and the risk that they pose to the students in the first place, because that is the reality of the past 20 years, is the legacy of incarceration that they've left behind. And you may not agree with that, and that's fine, but that's just my view. Sure. Um, I mean, can, can you imagine that, you know, if, if lots of resources were put into training people specifically for the purpose of preventing mass shootings and, and not to, right, like, in, in many cases, we have to be able to imagine how a thing could get better, whether that is gun control policy, the culture. Uh, and I, it seems like you're capable of imagining these things getting better, but, but not capable of imagining the, you know, a, a scenario where security guards get much better, right? It's like, we, we've got to improve some aspect of this. And it seems like the more, it just seems to me the more realistic and practical one is to try to improve. And I, I take all of your points about how people, security guards have abused their power in schools. No, no doubt. Um, but like, we have to be able to imagine some of this getting better. And it seems the, if the alternative is, you know, to, to, to figure to just figure out. And the truth is none of these things are mutually exclusive, right? Necessarily. You, you, we can parallel path it and we have to, to reduce this issue. Um, but you know, are, are we permanently in a scenario where at the very end of the day, if someone comes into a school with a gun, the only, the, the quickest thing that can be done is to call the police and hope they come in time. Is that, is that the limit of, of our ability 
practically to solve the issue and, and to hope that all of the early childhood work we're doing is reducing the number of these people to begin with? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you really wanted to focus on something that and may, you know, maybe my opinion changes on this. And I, I, I try to see these things from all sides and be willing to change my opinion when confronted with like new information. But I, from my view, you know, I don't think it necessarily doesn't mean there isn't anyone that isn't, you know, able theoretically for the security theater and comfortability of people to stop these things in these instances, assuming they actually would, which they haven't in the past 20 years at all. You know, especially in the case of my high school where that person was on campus and had been there for years. Um, you know, if you want to have someone there whose specific job is to do that, sure, let's do that. But I don't want to have, I don't want them to be armed in the first place. And I don't want to see them, I don't want to see videos of them going in and throwing students on the ground and beating the crap out of them and abusing their power and hiding behind their police unions and never being held accountable. Because, you know, as an example of that, Despite the fact the uh, SRO at my school did not stop the shooter at all um, because of the power of the union, uh, the policing union, and a number of other factors, and him saying that it was not part of his responsibility whatsoever to stop the shooting, and I think a judge wow. upholding that, wow, he got to get his job back, right? I don't think that's okay, right? That level of basically total lack of any accountability and the fact that he got to continue in that position despite all of that is ridiculous. But moving on, besides that point, I think the amount of resources, given the fact that despite 20 years of school, thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, if not more, the school resource officers being in schools hasn't stopped a single school, you know, school shooting. If we still want to have something like that, and we've seen the reality of students being beaten, their lives being possibly even endangered in some cases, and also being incarcerated, if we want to have somebody there to actually have, you know, the possibility whose sole responsibility is to stop a school shooting from happening that is unarmed, but is trained on how to de-escalate the situation and prevent that person from doing that or tackle them or whatever it may be. And they're, they're expected to sacrifice their life. Then so be it. But I don't want that person having a gun in the first place. And I certainly don't want to see them, you know, having the ability necessarily to go and arrest students for minor infractions that need a detention. Right or can be handled in a multitude of different ways that do not end up getting on their, their actual record and destroying any possibility they have at coming back from that mistake in life. That's the way that I see it, at least personally. And there are a number of serious policy issues that would need to be confronted within that specifically, because there are a number of ways where it completely falls off the rails that I can see. But if we wanted to live in a society where we did that, where we did advocate you know, some money towards you know, preventing school shootings in terms of uh, in terms of someone like that being there in the first place, I could be open to that. But I do believe that there's a ridiculous, for the impact that they're having, which is literally zero in the past 20 years of actually stopping these things from happening, or practically zero, right? For that impact, it's ridiculous that we're spending that much money when we could invest it in other places and diversify the number of solutions that we have at A, stopping st students from getting to that place, B, and B, preventing them, God forbid, should anything ever happen in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, so my final topic I, I want to discuss, and this is another one that there's a lot of interest in, obviously, is the Second Amendment and what your view on it is. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think Heller was a wrong decision, in my own opinion. <laughs> That's my own opinion. It's a very hot take. But I, I, I believe that if we look at the actual history of the Second Amendment uh, in the historical context uh, and based off, you know, as a history student and looking at this stuff, the real, you know, the reason it was created was initially for, you know, indigenous death squads, essentially, to steal Native American territory and violate a number of treaties that we had created with uh, Native Americans Um for people that were settling further and further west in and direct violation of native sovereignty. Um, then after that, it went on to become part of slave patrols and having a well-regulated militia, you know, to help patrol people and own people and, you know, uh, help provide for uh, the entire system of injustice and horror that was slavery in the United States. And after the end of slavery, that well-regulated militia went on to become policing. In some ways, it went on to become the National Guard. And that's still what I see it as. I don't see it necessarily as uh, it was 
as it was reviewed in Heller as an individual right necessarily. I, I think if we actually are talking about specifically what was meant in the original, you know, kind of founding, I believe it's a collective right of states, you know, to have something like a, a national guard or a policing system in the first place. I don't think it was ever talking about um, an individual right. And that's my own opinion. People are not going to agree with that. That's a very hot take on constitutional law, on history, and a number of other instances. But in the same ways that people are entitled to their own opinions, that's my own view. And there are plenty of people that disagree with me on that, but that's just how I see it. Yeah, I, I want to... So I want to question the logic of the point you made there, which is to point out that because the Second Amendment was born in a particular historical context that was racist and colonialist, that therefore that should bear on our assessment of it today. Like that, that's a logic I don't, I don't think goes through because, you know, if you apply that standard to say Planned Parenthood, one of whose founder was, was a eugenicist or, or very close to it, you know, by that logic, you should oppose Planned Parenthood today or. But um, I, I know, also New think York there's City's... a difference there in that Planned Parenthood is not the constitution of the United States. What I'm yeah. talking about here is the specific historic context of a founding document, right? That's what I'm talking about. But the logic should be the same. And it's like a thing isn't defined by the circumstances of its birth necessarily because things change you know, greatly over time, you know, for, for instance, New York city's gun, gun laws were, were famously, you know, constructed in a hotbed of anti, anti Italian and nativist sentiment where people, you know, the, the, one of the judges that ruled on a, on a important case in New York city said something very racist about Italians in the, in, in the opinion. Right. And, and that was part of how New York city's gun laws came about in, in the 20th century. But that doesn't mean our gun, that shouldn't influence my assessment of whether the gun laws in the city are good or bad today or how, how they should be changed. I think it's, a, I th I think it's, it's wrong to, to condemn something by the circumstances of its, of its birth. Well, I think it, it, but it's still, I believe it's still necessarily to acknowledge the historical context in which, yes, in that instance of the use of gun laws, it was racist for example, or was nativist in, in many ways. It's also important to acknowledge how gun ownership in the United States has also been racist in many ways as well, while acknowledging there are certain nuances, obviously with you know the abolition of slavery and a number of other instances that have happened in the time since. But the point, the main point that I was trying to get out there is that from my own view and the way that it was written, even if you know, putting aside that specific historical context around slavery, uh, an indigenous, basically death squads for the annexation of uh, the illegal annexation of native territory. Um, I think the point that I'm getting at is how it was, and in my view, still is a collective right, and it's not necessarily an individual right in the way that it was written in the first place. That's the point that I'm getting at, while still talking about what I see as some of the more problematic roots that should and should be acknowledged in the same way that some of the problematic roots at times, even with gun control, uh, should be acknowledged too. So that that's the point that I'm getting at there. Sure. So so would you would you be happy to see it re repealed? Um, I mean, I don't know if that's necessary uh, specifically. I I again, I, I I try to be more focused on how do we act realistically right now instead of trying to think of something that may or may not happen or even may or may not be necessary in the first place. And instead, how can we actually work together as a country to help resolve this issue in the first place um, while acknowledging it is a very sensitive area that many, many people very, you know, feel very emotionally attached to because of, you know, an, any mul multitude of reasons in the first place. And at least right now, I don't know if it needs to be abolished. I don't necessarily think it does, um, but I'm trying to acknowledge that I don't necessarily know everything in the first place. You know, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I'm always learning new things. I haven't gone to law school. Um, so I can't really necessarily talk on that specifically because I, on that, in, in regards to that specifically, I just don't know enough about it to really feel specifically one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, I think, um, I think we should wrap it up. This has been really enjoyable and I, ho I hope people on all sides of this issue can hear the points you and I are making and glean something of value from it. And, uh, 
it was a pleasure to have you on. Can you tell people where to follow you? Yeah. Uh, if people want to follow me, I'm just, uh, at David hog one, 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 three ones on Twitter. Um, and just David miles hog M I L E S, uh, with, and hog with two G's at, uh, on Instagram. And if I can just say like one final thing, uh, sure. as well, it's just look, ultimately I don't have all the answers as much as I would like to. I don't think anyone on either side has all the answers, but I think we can agree on the fact that something absolutely, even if small needs to be done about gun violence in this country and how we can work together to prevent it. Because as you and I are sitting here talking about the nuances that have to be held in these conversations, you know, there's still people out there dying. And unfortunately this debate is something that has been going on since before both you and I were born. And it's continued into our generation, frankly, yeah. to deal with, unfortunately. And I don't want to see another repeat of that. I don't want to keep here. I don't want other young people in the future, you know, or young adults in the future to have to hear, oh, thank God, you know, young people are here and we don't have to solve this issue anymore because you're going to fix it all. Um, because it, it shouldn't be on future generations to solve problems that we can confront today. And frankly, I, I believe that we should, even if we disagree on necessarily how to do it in the first place, I think we can all agree. Uh, that something needs to be done and we Absolutely. have to work together to do it. Um, yeah. So no matter where you stand on it, that's, let's just, let's make something happen. Completely agree. Thanks so much for yeah. coming on. All right. Thank you. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org and to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So you'll never miss my new content as always. Thanks for your support.